911, what's the nature of your emergency? Good morning, police, fire, military, and families, and to everybody who is listening in on the Tactical Living Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley Walton, and this morning, I'm not supposed to introduce our guest as the total badass that he is, because instead, he asked me to introduce him (laughs) as an American, a Vietnam veteran, and a published author, and this morning, I am very, very proud to introduce all of you to Mr. Paul Reed. Paul, how are you? Fine, thank you. Now, Paul has a story that is one to where when you pick up his book, you don't want to let it go because the story that Paul's going to share with us is one that almost seems unbelievable. And I have an ex-fiance, so I know what it's like to hate somebody so much that you wish death upon them. Good morning, everybody. And that's something very similar that Paul's going to share in terms of hating your enemy, but then later understanding that you and your enemy probably aren't too different and there's a way to find love and empathy if only you're willing to be open to it so um we are doing a giveaway today i have a really cool shirt i believe this one is i am the weapon yeah there's a grunt style i am the weapon t-shirt that we're giving away so whoever comments and engages the most on this thread within the next 24 hours i will send that over to you and paul i just want you to take it away start wherever you'd like well, I guess the story started in in high school, back when I was about 17. I wanted to go join the military, and I, I first saw Vietnam, the, the fighting in the jungle on the television. 17 years old, I wanted to go fight. <clears throat> My dad <clears throat> wouldn't let me because uh, you have to si- sign for a minor like that. But whenever I turned 18, I joined the military, wound up in Vietnam, in, in, in a very remote area of Vietnam known as Kontum, K-O-N-T-U-M. It's a province on the western side of Vietnam. And it's, it's very uh, like rainforest is the modern day terminology, but we used to call it the jungle. And it's thick, solid jungle. Anyway, that's, uh, that's where I began my Vietnam uh, tour of duty in Kontum. In, in some very strenuous uh, combat. Uh, I could paint you a little story for, uh, for those that weren't there, and thank God you weren't there, but uh, everything I had, everything I owned was on my back. And it was about, total about 80, 80 pounds. When you put the ammunition in there, Five days worth of food, your your sleeping gear, your riding gear, and your ammunition, your for your M16 or your 45, whatever you carried, and uh, we slept on the ground every night, and there were leeches and snakes with us, and monkeys and all kind of birds squawking and lizards that actually spoke to you. <laughs> they said some English words I can't say on this podcast. <laughs> Very strange to hear that out in the jungle. But when the sun went down, that's when we had already had our our holes dug, our foxholes dug. We dug foxholes every night, and we moved every day. And I I dug so many foxholes, I thought I was going to dig in my own grave there for a while. But we moved every day through the jungle, humping this stuff on what was known as search and destroy missions. It was our job to search out the enemy and literally and I mean, literally destroy them. But um, we we stopped every day about three o'clock after moving maybe a mile or two through the through the sweep. Um, I, I never saw a flushing toilet in Vietnam. I stayed in the jungle uh, my whole tour, except when I was coming and going. But uh, l- let me let me back up just a little bit. The, the training, because this is very pertinent to the story here, the training that I received before going over, they didn't have enough combat soldiers that wanted to actually fight and go into combat. So they had to train people very quickly. 
And the way they did it was they dehumanized the enemy. And I think we see that going on today a lot. Uh, we see other people as not human or, or we see people as the enemy and we dehumanize them. You know, we, we give them names that are non-human names like Bill or George or Sue or Peggy or something like that. But we give them these, these labels and we dehumanize people. Well, that's what they did to us uh, as part of training. I, I don't, I'm not knocking the training. It was very, very um, necessary for us to stay alive. And uh, as you know, there were around 60,000 of my generation that, that died there. Uh, and another 50 or 60,000 that, that committed suicide after they came home because of the stress, the emotional stress. It rained every day. It rained every night. And when it wasn't raining, I wake up sweating, s sweating, soaking wet with sweat because the temperature was about 100 degrees at night, 110, something like that, a very extremely humid. And I woke up every morning with these leeches sucking my blood. And you can't just pull them off. You can't leave their heads in you because it, they'll, they'll get infected. And uh, they treated us with with uh, antibiotics, but pretty soon that even those were didn't become effective. But back to the training, they taught us that our enemy was not human, that they were different than us. And the whole purpose in this podcast today is, I hope people can find out that we are all more alike than not. And that's the good thing about this message. But back then, they were different. They were, they were, I hate to say it, but we looked at them as little animals and gave them these, gave them these names that were non-human names and everything like that. But that was so we would destroy them. Uh, you know, you don't want to kill your friends. So... They, they became these things that we labeled, labeled them with. It, the military had to do it because, as I said, they didn't have enough people to go over there and do it. And they, it, it, it was a process of conditioning. The same word is, is a, a stronger word is brainwashing. And, I don't really want to use that word, but it borders on brainwashing because a lot of my friends are already deceased after coming home. And they took that, they took that training to their grave. They, they never got past, they never got past the, the, the dehumanization part. And they, it's very strong, but fortunately I had some intervention from heaven that helped me get past it. Paula, I want to interrupt you just for a second because I'm wondering what what that mindset must have been like for this 18-year-old kid getting trained to go off to war. Your dad didn't want you to go. And I, I think that brainwashing is really a relative term to use when I haven't heard used in this context before. But good morning, everybody. But you are you're being groomed in a sense to be exactly what they need you to be in a way that is as intense as possible because the the fighting capacity was so limited. So what was that mindset like for you being so young, being thrown into something like this? Well, of course, I, I look back in retrospect. Uh, I, I say that I was born to be a warrior. And I accepted it dutifully. I, I just accepted it. And that's what I became. I became a warrior. And I accepted everything. In other words, I bought it hook, line, and sinker as a young person. And it stayed with me all throughout the war. And certainly at least another two decades after the war. It was so powerful. But as I said before, I had some intervention and that changed things. We'll talk about that in a minute. But it was so disruptive in civilian life. 
after coming home, I'd been through a couple of divorces and, you know, I wound up homeless because of that, that, that kind of thinking. And it's known as PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. They call it a disorder, but I like to call it an, an order because it's in your mind, kind of like a Trojan uh, virus inside a computer. It controls your, your thinking. And uh, the way it does that, when you're under trauma, when you're under fire, which we were often almost every day and night, when you're under fire, you, you don't know if you're going to die that second or that moment or, or if the next round is going to hit you. The ones you can hear, they're, they're going past you. But the ones you don't hear, those are the ones you catch. And obviously, you don't want to catch any of those. But uh, when, when you're waiting for those mortars that are up in the air for 10, 15 seconds to come down and land, you don't know if they're going to land on you or the guy next to you or going to rip your body to shreds. You don't know that. And that's trauma right there. That's trauma in the worst case, the worst sense of the meaning. And what happens at that point is some of the nerve endings in your brain disconnect. And it causes a different way of thinking. That's why they say, oh, that war really changed those, those, those guys. That, that war really changed him. He came home a different person. Yeah, he did because he's thinking differently. He was probably traumatized. And those nerve endings probably never go back to where they originally were. So that's how the changing takes place. The, the, the thought patterns take place. And as a civilian, I, I wound up extremely disturbed. I made a lot of bad choices and a lot of bad decisions because my thinking had changed. So that's how it affected me. And it just, it just destroyed. It will kill a person if they let it get to them. As I said, I had some intervention, but uh, I, I brought all that stuff home and it, I suffered with it for over two decades. Yeah, there's a comment here I'd like to read. It says, like the Muslims thought as terrorists, same training I got in the military at 18. I call it brainwashed. Ashley Walton, I love this show. Thank you, awesome lady. Thank you guys for tuning in. Now, now, Paul, you're in the midst of the jungle, and it's actually because of the war that you were involved in that we even have coined the term PTSD. And so I'm, I'm really glad that, that you brought that up. So talk to us a little bit more about what transpired after that. Okay. That's correct. The term PTSD is the, the modern day version. I think they called it soldier's heart in, in during the Civil War, maybe shell shock in World War II or uh, battle fatigue in Korea or something like that. But in Vietnam, they labeled it PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. All right, we're in the jungle. Uh, I think my first few days in Kantum province, uh, we, we had uh, identified where the enemy was. They were located in a, a huge bunker complex on the top of this one hill. Uh, it, the, it's a nameless hill, actually, but the, we call it Hill 1064 because it was 1064 meters high, which is over 3,000 feet. And when you're at the bottom of that thing and you're humping up 80 pounds of rucksack plus uh, a shovel and M16 or mortar tube or something like that, it's it's. <laughs> It's terrible getting to the top, but you know, at the top, there's somebody waiting for you. And we identified this uh, unit at the top of this hill, 1064, and we went after them. Well, the first day that I was out there, they killed three of us. And so we, we, uh, we pulled, we pulled back a little bit. We went back down the valley and, uh, and set up and the commanding officer, Captain Jim Davis, uh, sent me and about eight or nine others out on a reconnaissance mission, recon, uh, to find a better way up the hill so we could attack them from a different direction so, so we didn't lose any more soldiers. Uh, so I was on this recon mission and about 300 meters, I think, away from us. Now, keep in mind, you can't walk straight up uh, it's a green an ocean of green leaves and these trees are like a hundred feet tall at least. So it's dark in there, bamboo thickets everywhere. And it's hilly. It's, it's up and down. And, uh, the sun is out. It's 110 degrees and you're just wringing wet with sweat. But we accidentally stepped into this enemy base camp 
And it, it, the, the first time I got in the camp, I saw stair steps off to one side leading up a mountain. I said, stair steps? What in the world are animals, little animals, needing stair steps for? <laughs> I know that sounds ridiculous, but that was the mindset of an 18-year-old who had uh, been taught to dehumanize the enemy. But they used those stair steps to get away quickly. But there was one lone sentry in there. We killed him and entered the base camp. It's probably about 900 or 1,000 square feet to put it in perspective. And inside this camp were, was a, a freshwater stream. We're in the mountains, right? Uh, a beautiful freshwater stream. They had a, an area for cooking rice and cooking, and uh, they had an area for uh, medical supplies, and there was a lot of bloody gauze all over the ground. So they were getting in our, our, uh, our, our gun sites, our crosshairs. And uh, I looked, I looked off to one side, and there sat a, a stack of what's called backpacks. We call them rucksacks, but they were backpacks for, for lack of a better terminology. And uh, I, I didn't know how many, but we got on the horn immediately, and the horn is the radio. And we called six. That's uh, that was the captain. Um, six, six. Uh, you got Al Alpha Six Kilo here. What do you got? Will you give me a sit rep. What do you got? We got, we got this. We got a hospital zone, cooking area zone, ammo storage. And we got backpacks. When he heard the term backpacks, he immediately screamed in that that phone and says, "Get those backpacks and get the hell out of there now!" We heard shooting. We heard firing. And he felt like that the uh, the others were on, on, on the in, in the bunker complex were heard it too, and they were going to be after us. So that was the that was why he wanted us to hurry and get out of there. But uh, we we got all those backpacks. The, the average height of a Vietnamese soldier back then was about four feet ten inches. So they they didn't have very large backpacks. We put about uh, we put about three on each arm and then went back to our our. Uh, our location. Uh, it turned out there were like 52 backpacks. And I got these, we, we got back to our, our perimeter, which was, you know, a few hundred meters away from where they were on the top of that hill. And we, everybody just dropped those backpacks right where they were. And we all walked off and my LT, uh, LT Doan, he says, uh, wait a minute, where y'all going? And he said, well, 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 sir, we're like hungry. We were bringing wet with sweat and thirsty. And we wanted to eat, even though it was sea rations, a terrible taste, and we, we were hungry. And he said, no, you got to get back here. You got to search these things. Well, some, some wise guy said, why is that? You know, the enlisted never, never uh, questions the, uh, the officers. But he did answer, and he said, because we got to have the intel. S2 needs the intel. We need to know how many there are, where they're going, what their mission is, and where they're from. Roger that, sir. So um, I got, I just grabbed one. There was like 52 of them. And, you know, they all looked alike. They all looked identical. Uh, and we call them Charlie Packs. That was another dehumanization name. You know, we call them Charlie sometimes. That's one of the nicer names. But uh, I just grabbed one and opened it up, and by that time, uh, Lieutenant Doan was standing on my right side and Captain Davis on my left side. They wanted to see what was in there, just like me. You know, there was a book out a few years ago, The Things They Carried. Well, they were he was talking about American soldiers. You know, it was a fictional, but uh, they were talking about the things the Americans carried. So uh, this was way before that book came out, but... I wanted to see the things that, that the enemy guys carried. And so did Captain Davis and Lieutenant Doan. Uh, so open that backpack up and right on the top were two flags, a Viet Cong flag and a, and a unit and a unit flag. And immediately Captain Davis, he said, give me that Viet Cong flag. <laughs> I didn't want to do it, but I wound up doing it. I wound up giving it to him. And, but I had these, envisions these images of these flags on my wall at home you know uh, that's quite a that's quite a uh, 
quite a quite a uh, object to display at home, you know, flags. And uh, in just a few minutes, Lieutenant Don he he wanted to get that that unit flag, so I had to give up both of them. And right after that, he went off and did a photo op with some of the guys in the platoon, you know, him holding that flag, you know, and the, I've got that picture in the book, by the way. <clears throat> Any, anyway, uh, I, I kept on digging and there was a plastic bag. You had to carry everything that you wanted to keep dry in plastic because it rained every day. It rained on them too, as well as us. Inside the bag, I, I, I kind of, it was a transparent plastic bag. I kind of tried to look through it. And, and see what was in it. I saw some stamps and some money and a pair of scissors and and uh, some photographs, some little bitty tiny photographs. So I, uh, and a and a small book that looked that looked to me like a little bitty diary. And so I dumped everything out. And that small book was most intriguing. It was about three four inches high and about three inches wide. And I opened it up, and it was a Everything was written in Vietnamese, understand, but the handwriting was gorgeous. I'm telling you, it's some of the most beautiful, beautiful handwriting I've ever seen, even though I couldn't read it. It was beautiful handwriting. And so I looked at the tiny photos and, you know, so these are the things that the, the enemy carried, I'm saying, you know, I'm seeing. These are the things they carried. I said, wow, this is awesome. You know, well, I made up my mind. I'm going to keep those things. Well, I stuffed them in my backpack and uh, I think within about 30 or 45 minutes, Lieutenant Doan came over and he said, all right, guys, I got to have everything y'all took out of them backpacks earlier. And somebody said, again, why? And he told them. And uh, okay. So they gave him everything they had, the pistols, the grenades, the photographs. And, uh, and, he, and he had a handful of this stuff and he's walking off and he, turns around and just eyeballs me, you know, and I stand there shrugging my shoulders. I mean, he was standing there. He saw everything that came out of that backpack that I was searching. And I just shrugged my shoulders. Well, he turned around and walked off. And that night uh, I, I, I said, how am I going to get this out of the country, man? There's not a, not a post office there where you look on every street corner, you know? So I thought about it. I got a C ration box that a heavy duty cardboard and I, I made a shipping carton it looked kind of like a Fed federal express shipping carton and i put everything in that box and by the way this is the name of my book the healing box and i put everything in that box and i wrote you know you just folded the corners because it, you didn't have any scotch tape or <laughs> or stable machines or anything like that but i uh, i wrote my parents address on it in Dallas and my return address, APO 96250. And the next morning, a helicopter was coming in with, with uh, water and some food and everything. And I said, that's it, that's it. And so I made a mad dash for that helicopter. It's about a hundred meters away. And before I got about halfway, that helicopter started lifting off and uh, the 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 door gunner on the left side m might have been what they call a crew chief. I'm I'm not sure, but he saw me running. So the helicopter lowered back down to about a four foot um, hover, and he w motioned for me to come on. So I, I dashed up to the helicopter, and about the time I got there, the 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 door gunner he, he jumped up and grabbed that box right out of my hands, and they, then he took off. Whoop, 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 whoop. They just took off, and I watched it go. And I said, you know, I, I really want this box to to get home. I really want those things, but I know helicopters get shot out of the air. Uh, they take rockets. Uh, door gunners drop stuff in rice paddies. Um, door gunners don't always do what they said they would do, you know. So I realized at that point watching it fly off that that box clearly was in other hands. And I went about back to my platoon and, and uh, got ready for the day.
Any questions? I'm enjoying this. Keep going. Outstanding. And so, okay, l let me just end it right there. I except for I got 10 days later, I got a letter from my mother that that box had arrived in Dallas. And so I was very thankful for that. I went ahead and did 11 more months of combat in the jungle. Somehow I survived. I got all my fingers, all my toes. There were several very close calls. We, we don't have time to go into that today, and that's not the purpose of this podcast. But I came home after after a year du duty there, <clears throat> suffering tr tremendously, did not know how badly I was suffering. But um, guys with PTSD or people with PTSD, anybody, you know, the most common, I think, is wartime, but I think everybody may have a touch of PTSD. You know, if you've been in a fight with your former wife or your husband or your spouse or whatever, or an employer or an employee situation fighting, or maybe somebody in your neighborhood, you know, that's trauma. We've all been trauma, and we all have, you know, maybe a, maybe a disease or something like that can, can leave us traumatized. But we, we, all, we all have a a degree of varying degrees of post-traumatic stress. But I had one of the worst cases. And one of the ways that I found out that was most com comfortable for me to treat it was to isolate myself. And so I started driving a truck. And I drove a truck um, interstate. I ran principal run was to Canada every, every week, Ontario, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Alberta, and BC every week. And by myself, that that was the way I handled it, isolated, because I I didn't interact well with people after coming yeah. home. There's a great question here. Um, I'm guessing that you're referring to the items in the box. So do the items trigger your PTSD? They want to know. Uh, did did the items trigger the PTSD? Do they have any kind of? Home? Yeah, I think that's what they're asking. Y yes, it very very definitely did. Uh, but um, I'm getting to that part of the story but uh okay so 20 years i drove this truck and i recognized something was wrong with me um be because of the anger that i had and some of the outbursts of anger and and fits and dreams and uh emotional fits i, I recognized something was wrong with me while i was driving that truck but and, and, and indeed, the, the PTSD I was suffering from, I didn't even know what it was, but it, it caused me to be homeless. And I lost a beautiful house and with some land and a good job making a lot of money and lost my family. I virtually went down to the bottom of the ocean below whale poop poop, and that's pretty low. <coughs> Excuse me. And I was homeless. And... I was under this underpass and my father found me, located me one day and, and said, look, me and mom had talked about, you know, offering you your old room as when you grew up until you can get back on your feet. I said, dad, I, I can't do that. I'm, I'm a grown man. I'm 38 years old. I can't do that. He said, you have to do it. I said, why? He said, you have a son. You, you got a son going on five years old. No court in the law, in the land, will give custody to a child to a homeless person. He said, you got a point. I said, you got a point. So I moved in with my mom and my dad. And I had stuffed all this stuff for all these years. But I did some of my prior military buddies who were in NOM. They said, we're going to take you to the counselor. And that was a really good thing that they did for me. Because the, the counselor told me, he said, you, you're, st you're holding it in. You're holding it in. Well, in Vietnam, we stuffed it. Perhaps all combat veterans did that, you know, from Iraq, Afghanistan, or the first Gulf War. Perhaps they all did that. But this guy, this counselor was saying, you need to talk about these things. So I said, okay. Okay. So I started talking about, I got these opportunities to go stuff to high schools and, uh, about history. You know, they wanted to hear somebody about talk about the Vietnam War. And so naturally that bled over to the dinner table at home. 
and, and my, my mother and father, they, they didn't know what PTSD was, but they knew I was suffering. And I started telling this one story and one, uh, one battle story. And mom says, wait a minute. And she left the dinner table and she came back with, guess what? It's, it's just, which is 20 years after I'm in the jungle in Vietnam, she came back with that box. <laughs> and she said, do you remember this? I said, where's that been all these years? She said, well, it's been up in the attic. I said, for Pete's sakes, I forgot all about that thing. My dad chimed in. He said, well, I thought it was trash. I almost threw it away. <laughs> Thank goodness he didn't. But I opened it up, and that is when the PTSD hit me. The Out of the blue, it just lambasted me because the they didn't open it. It set up there, and it kept the odors and the aroma from the jungle up there all nicely tight tight sealed and everything but when i opened it up those aromas hit me in the face like a baseball bat boom <clears throat> excuse me and i i had to deal with that stuff for several months before i could even really touch it and so uh, everything was in that box just exactly like i packed it in the jungle 20 years earlier it was all there untouched and when I opened that little that little plastic bag that that he had in there, that aroma came out and just blew me blew me away. Flashback, I couldn't sleep. Uh, the anger fits came back on. The bad dreams, um, er everything was just like I was still in Vietnam. It was uh, it was it was horrible. But over the months, over the weeks and the months, I was able to to pick that little book up. And of course, it was in Vietnamese. I couldn't read it, but I did admire the handwriting. And it was in beautiful blue ink. It hadn't faded. And I did admire this. This handwriting it was simply the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. And my mom says, What does it say? I was, she saw me flipping the pages one day and she was looking over my shoulder. She says, <clears throat> What does that say? I said, I don't know, mom. It's all in Vietnamese. For Pete's sakes, and you know, I, I still had these anger fits, and and uh, li literally, I hate to use the word hate, but I, I literally hated the the guy that that wrote this, and I hated all of his fellow soldiers. I hated Vietnam. I hated the war. I hated everything. Because look at me, I, I'm a disaster. Look at look at what it's done to me. It, it's kind of a normal thing, I think, to hate something like that. But I hated this guy. And so mom says, well, you should get it translated. Maybe there's something in there that can help you. And I said, I ain't going to do that. <laughs> you know, I didn't care about what, what no enemy soldier wrote, you know. But uh, I, I eventually wound up getting it translated. And uh, there, there was a... A South Vietnamese guy, of course, you know, the South supposedly lost the war. And there was a South Vietnamese guy that he, I got him to translate it for me into English. And when he gave it to me, he said, man, he said, I hate this guy like you because he enemy, he enemy. But he said, I got to tell you something true. I got to tell you true. I said, what's that, Joe? What's that? He said, this guy, good man. I said, what? Have you lost your mind? This guy ain't no good man. He killed my buddy, man. He killed a half a dozen of us. Are you kidding? He said, no. No, this guy, good man. He, he family, he a uh, pillar in his home village. He good man. He like uncle figure. I said, oh, give me that and get out of here. And I grabbed that translation. I stormed out the door. I just wrinkled it all up. And threw it on my desk at home where, where I was living in the room I grew up in. And uh, I just I had no intentions of reading it ever. But uh, I was in there one day screaming to God, waving my fist up toward heaven. You know, when, when you don't have anybody else to blame, we always blame God. So I was screaming out to God, why have you done this to me? Look at me. I, I'm, I'm a disaster. You know, I had a nice house. I had I had land, I had a family, I had a good job, I had total 
everything was great. But now I'm at zero. I, I don't even have, I have to take $20 from my dad just to buy coffee. And, and uh, the word came back, well, I, I thought I heard you say a prayer one day. You wanted to, you wanted to get some peace in your life. And right then, it hit me upside the head. Yeah, I, I did pray that prayer. I, I do want to get peace. He said, okay. Okay, so that was comforting in itself, just getting an answer that quickly. And, okay, all right, now that I'm here, I'm here where I'm supposed to be. I fully get that. What's the purpose I'm here? And in that instant, the desk was calling out to me. The desk that the translation, the English translation was under a bunch of bunch of junk. The desk was calling out to me. And so I went over and I sat down at that desk and I moved everything. And there was that translation in English sitting there staring at me. And I'd never even read it. But on this occasion, <coughs> excuse me, on this occasion, I, I picked it up. And I could see all everything was in the format of poems. I said, okay, okay, okay. So the, the, the guy wrote poems. Okay, I get that. And I just flipped through it and kept flipping and kept flipping. I, I noticed the titles of these different poems. He had them titled. And I got to the, the one on the last page. And that literally blew my mind. I mean, I started really screaming at that point and jumping up and down. I, I guess my mom in the kitchen heard me. She came to the door and she, what's wrong? What's wrong? And I, I thought that she would be on my side, my mom. I said, this guy wrote poetry, mom. And she said, well, what's wrong with that? A lot of guys in the, in the army and in combat Right, wrote poems about home and stuff. She said, I've seen it on the movies. But I, I could see she, you know, kind of took his side. And that, that kind of made me angry. But I went on and on and on. And, and I said, that's not the worst of it. She said, well, what, what's the worst of it? It's this poem right here. She said, you mean the one titled Love? I said, yeah, that one. I said, the enemy can't love. They don't know what the word means. They ain't human. He shouldn't be writing that in that book. He shouldn't be doing that. And again, she took his side. You know, well, a lot of guys, they're lonely for home, you know. She said, go make some coffee and come back. When I got back, she read that poem out loud to me. And at that point, it was just an instantaneous change. Somehow, somehow, the words from that poem jump into my heart. And automatically, I had different vision. It changed my sight. It, every, I don't know how to explain it, but my mind had been regenerated with, with love instead of hate. And... I, I mean, it was instantaneous. Um, I, I saw this enemy guy as a brother. And I realized a couple of really important things I want to stress here. That this guy spoke a different language. This guy had different shaped eyes, different colored eyes. He had different different traditions, different culture. He had different colored skin a little bit. And he lived on the different on the opposite side of the world from me. And he had a different language. Everything about him was different. But in this one instance, I saw him as the same as me. Identical. We were brothers. And I'd hated this guy for over two decades. But suddenly, suddenly I loved this guy. And I realized that he and I were so similar. We were like in the same skin. We were so much alike that we were in the same skin. And I, I realized at that moment that, hey, 
If you keep hating this guy, Reed, it's the same thing as hating yourself because he was doing what his country told him to do. He was going along with everything he was supposed to do. But if you keep hating him, you're hating yourself. Then I realized very quickly after that, on the flip side of that, if you forgive him, it's like forgiveness for yourself. And so automatically I screamed out, I forgive him. I forgive him for everything he did to me. And I'm going to forget it. And at that point in time, the weight of the PTSD, the way the world lifted from my shoulders, I felt so relieved. I felt so at peace. And so that's, uh, that's how what I was talking about, the intervention that came to me that changed me. And so, uh, okay, what am I supposed to do now? This Well, you need to tell as many people as you can about this. What is that, a book or a movie? Well, uh, whatever. Well, I, I, I'm not a writer. Don't worry, I'll get you somebody. <laughs> but that, that first book I hammered out was Contum Diary. Captured writings bring peace to a Vietnam veteran. Uh, I had to have a lot of help with that. But uh, I, I started working on that book immediately, and I recognized the value of this little book would be to this guy's wife. So I made plans to take this little book that had a lot of poetry in it about her that the guy had written to her. I didn't know how I was going to pay for it because I was homeless and broke and everything. But uh, somehow the, the story got out of some PBS guys and they called me up and said, did you capture this? I said, yeah. You still have it? I said, yeah. They said, did you, is the guy alive or dead? I said, he's dead. Did you kill him? I said, I think so. He said, well, we think this is going to make a great PBS film. You taking that little journal to the guy's wife. And so we would like to take you on an all expense paid trip to find his wife. And so you can do that. If you agree to let us film, I said, yeah, let's do it. So we did it. We went over there. Um, I forget exactly how many years, 20, 25 years, 25 years later after our battle. And this crew had looked up the family and uh, they, they'd gone over there earlier. And when they came home, I said, any word about him? Anything, anything about what finally happened to him? No, we found the family. I said, what does family mean? Aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters, cousins. But I said, no word about him. They said, no, no word about him. Okay, so we went over there. And when I got at the airport, I met uh, a guy named Lung Kani, who was working for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And he, he told me at that time that uh, the, the guy that I thought I killed had actually lived and survived the war and was at home living with his wife in, in North Vietnam and actually wanted to meet me. I said, what? <laughs> the guy wants to meet me. Are you kidding? He said, no. I said, is he going to try to kill me? He said, no, no, no. He wants to meet you and be friends. I said, amazing. So <laughs> that's pretty much the story. Except... Yeah, that- uh, there's some great comments here. I want to make sure that we don't we don't pass them up. Some items did the same for me, the smell as well. I believe that both sides in the war are both brainwashed. The heart changed from stone to a living, loving heart. Yes, absolutely. That's so awesome. I remember my mom having to keep our neighbor outside one day when my grandfather was visiting. Super nice lady, but she was Vietnamese. I didn't quite understand at the time. Yeah, and that's, that's exactly the, the testament and, and something that I think a lot of us, unless we experienced it firsthand, we experienced it only secondhand in that same way. So, Paul, I want to I want to backtrack just for one second, because there was a there was a point in your book that I actually had to text you because I told you that it made me cry. I'm like sobbing, crying. And I look over at my husband and he's like, what is it? And I'm like, you need to read the book because I can't like explain in depth how emotional this part of the story is. But there was one moment in your story that I think is important to share just to kind of spread your relationship with how important that 
guiding whisper was, you know, call it God, call it the universe, your higher power, because that's a true testament to all of these action steps that have taken place throughout this journey for you. And there was one point in the book where you just started screaming, I love Tony. So can you just tell us that story really quickly? Yeah, very, very uh, quickly. I'll try to give you the short version. Tony was a guy in in a church I was going to, and and he he had a different doctrine. He he taught something that I wasn't familiar that I wasn't raised with, and uh, I re really literally we started hating each other because of that. Uh, something as stupid as that. Anyway, anyway, uh, I was still driving a truck, and I was on the way to Albuquerque, and it's about one o'clock in the morning, and uh. All of a sudden, I mean, I literally hated this guy with a passion. And there's no way in the world I would ever say I love Tony. There's no way in the world I would ever say that. But about 10, 15 miles uh, east, east of uh, Albuquerque, that's at 1 o'clock in the morning, that's what came out of my mouth was I love Tony. I love Tony. I love Tony. And I was amazed that I heard myself say that because I knew I would never say that, right? So where is this coming from? Well, it turns out it was God, Heavenly Father, whatever you want to call him, was making a statement. He was saying, I love Tony. Well, this was before... I had the experience with the North Vietnamese guy. It was sort of a precursor to, to uh, uh, finding forgiveness and reconciliation and love for, for a brother, an actual brother. But uh, I, 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 my heart, I felt my heart change. I felt my heart relieve itself. And, and I knew that my heart had changed because of that, because I heard, I heard, I heard him say, I love Tony. And that was his declaration that he loved Tony. And I said, wow. And so it, anyway, uh, I said, what's this all about? And he says, and I, I got, well, Tony's not going to be around much longer. Okay. And the communication was when you get home after this trip, go see Tony, just walk in his front door. And like, like your family. I said, what? It says, you're going to be that good of friends. Okay, so I went ahead and made my deliveries and got back in time for church. We went to church every Wednesday night, kind of Bible study. And they, the pastor always asked for somebody, do you have any testimony or something like that you'd like to give? Well, I was 10 minutes late, but Tony was already at the uh, podium. And he was talking about how we need to be good to our friends, and especially our family and other people in church, you know. And then all of a sudden he made this declaration that he said, well, I've got something to tell, tell the church here. We were like, Oh, what's that? He said, well, I went to the doctor today and I was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Everybody goes, Oh my gosh. And it, of course I'm saying, Oh my gosh, because I got word early on two days earlier that he wasn't going to be around that much longer. And for me to, that we were going to be good friends, that that relationship had been healed. Anyway, he was saying he had six months to live. And uh, I mean, that was, that was sad. You, you don't want to see anybody pass away. You, you know, that was so sad. He was a decent man. And uh, he, did, he did love God and everything. But uh, I heard that, and it was a confirmation that it was God that told me those things about Tony. So I wondered where it was going. But about near the end of the service, um, the, the pastor said, a anybody care to say anything else? And Tony raised his hand. What do you want, Tony? He said, I want to be baptized. And so pastor said, how many times is this? This is my third time. So he explained to him, well, you usually do it after you get saved or have a conversion experience, you know, whatever. But he says, I know that, but this one's real. And so, okay, come on back. He, he started running the water in the baptistry. And anybody else? Well, I raised my hand. He said, what do you want? I said, I want to be baptized. <laughs> he said, how many times is this for you? I said, third time. He said, well, you heard what I said to him, right? Yeah. Come on back. So we got baptized together, me and Tony. 
we got baptized together. And I'm telling you, that was remarkable because if we saw each other downtown, we would get on the other side of the road. We wouldn't even come near one another. And same thing in the church. If he's coming down one aisle, I'd go to the other. If he's going down one aisle, I'd go to the other and vice versa. So to be baptized together was remarkable. And we were both back there soaking wet. And he says, he says, Paul, uh, I, I want you to know, um, I, I love you, brother. I said, what? He said, I love you, brother. I said, well, I love you too, Tony. I love you too. And I truly did. I love this guy. And he says, he says, uh, can you forgive me for the way I treated you? I said, yeah, I can forgive you, brother. I said, can you forgive me? He said, yeah, I can forgive you, man. I love you. And so, uh, you, you know, God healed that relationship from hatred to, to love. It was the precursor for me uh, quite a few years later, about a decade later, when, when I, I discovered all those things about my enemy, us being more alike than different. But uh, Tony, unfortunately... This might be what you shed some tears over. Unfortunately, Tony, almost six months to the day, Tony passed away. And that was a revelation that I've never forgotten about. That, that there is a higher power and that he does talk through people and he does heal relationships. And uh, he, he does good things for people when they ask him. Yeah, that was such a beautiful story. And it tied into the the essence of the entire book so well. Um, there's a few more comments here before we wrap this up. That's God at work for sure. Good morning, Mr. Enriquez. For me, bitterness is a cancer for the one that carries the bitterness. Yes, I could not agree with that more. Now, Paul, um, I know that you have the healing box now. So before this comes to an end, can you kind of share a little bit about what you're doing now, what the healing box is, and how people can get a hold of you? Well, the uh, the uh, the uh, internet website address is thehealingbox.net, not dot com, but the thehealingbox.net. And they, they can order the book. They can get a, a an author signed copy for the same price if they went through Amazon. They can download it for only a few bucks from Amazon if they choose to do that on the Kindle. But the, the healing box is my attempt to to share love with people and uh, that that and also to let people know that we are all more alike than not we're more alike than different and the the the, the people that frequent your oh. podcast they 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 are people that love they they love their country they love their fellow human beings and and they do a service of love and that's real love people are loving perhaps and they don't even know they're loving but i attempt in this book to show people that they're they're really loving, and maybe they don't even know that they're they're loving. But uh, love is the ability to perceive potential in others, ourselves, and things, and caring enough about those others, ourselves, and things to help them reach their fullest potential. And, you know, it's like a farmer raising his crop. He nurtures that, waters it, fertilizes it until it reaches its fullest potential. It's like our kids. We 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 feed them, we clothe them, we put a roof over their head. You know, we educate them. That's love. And these people that are that are military, these people that are first responders, uh, they they are loving. They are loving kind of people, and that's one of the things that I want people to know. And that's one of the reasons I wrote the book. Awesome. This has been one of the most awe-inspiring stories and one that I'm proud to showcase here. So thank you so much for sharing all of your time and to have the strength and the courage to share such an intimate story in the way that you do call it something that I genuinely appreciate. And I know that a lot of other people are going to be able to connect with. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ashley. I appreciate the opportunity to talk and share the story. Thank you. It's my pleasure. So you guys can check out thehealingbox.net 
and Paul has written The Healing Box as well as The Contune Diary. You can get those both on Amazon or on his website. And I'll go ahead and I will leave those links down below. Thanks, guys. 911, what's the nature of your emergency? 